Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. Hi, just me today. I'm going to bring you the concurring opinion of Justice McLaughlin in Machtinger and HOJ Industries. If you want to listen to the majority's decision, or if you want to hear me and Zach chat about the case, head on over to the previous episode. Hope you enjoy. The following are the reasons delivered by Justice McLaughlin. I agree with my colleague, Justice Yakabuchi that the judgment of the Court of Appeal must be set aside and that the plaintiffs are entitled to reasonable notice, notwithstanding the contractual terms to the contrary. While I am in substantial agreement with my colleague, I find that I differ from him on one, to my mind, crucial point. In my view, resolution of this case necessarily involves an examination of the principles of law governing implied contractual terms, and in particular, the role to be assigned to the intention of the parties in determining the term to be implied in a case such as this. This, as I apprehend the arguments and the judgments below, is the heart of the debate before us. The cause of action on which the plaintiffs rely is breach of contract, to be more specific, breach of a contract of employment. To succeed, each plaintiff must establish a. The existence of a term of the contract entitling him to reasonable notice of termination, and b. That the term was breached by the employer. Justice Yakabuchi purports to circumvent this algorithm by stating that the case can be resolved on the narrower ground of a presumption. But to assist the plaintiffs, that presumption must operate so as to presume the existence of a term of reasonable notice in the contract. Otherwise, the plaintiffs have no cause of action. To put it another way, a presumption is simply an evidentiary technique by which the elements of a cause of action may be established. It cannot itself stand as an element of a cause of action. So any attempt to avoid the question of implied terms is illusory, as I see the matter. The difficulty experienced by each plaintiff is that the contract between him and his employer contained an express term stipulating that the plaintiff was entitled, in the case of Machtinger, to no notice whatsoever, and in the case of Lefebvre, only two weeks' notice. The first problem is to displace this term. That is done by the Employment Standards Act, RSO 1980, of which stipulated a minimum period of notice in the circumstances of this case of four weeks. As explained by Justice Yakabuchi, the effect of Sections 3 and 4 of the Act is to render the stipulation for lesser notice null and void. We arrive then at the situation where there is no term in the contract dealing with notice upon dismissal. The law says that where the contract is silent as to the term of notice upon dismissal, the court will imply a term of notice. But what term should be implied? Here the courts below divided. The trial judge says the term to be implied is one for reasonable notice. He based his assessment of reasonable notice on what was generally fair in the circumstances without reduction for the fact that the parties to the contract had expressed the intention in their contracts that the plaintiffs were to be entitled to no or only nominal notice. He found that period to be seven months in the case of Machtinger, seven and a half months in the case of Lefebvre. The Court of Appeal, on the other hand, felt that the term implied must reflect the intention of the parties. Since the parties never intended notice of seven to seven and a half months, the court imposed the term which, within the limits of the act, best reflected that intention, namely four weeks. So the real issue is this. In the absence in a contract of employment of a legally enforceable term providing for notice on termination, on what basis is a court to imply a notice period, and in particular, to what extent is intention to be taken into account in fixing an implied term of reasonable notice in an employment contract? This question cannot be answered without examining the legal principles governing the implication of terms. The intention of the contracting parties is relevant to the determination of some implied terms, but not all. Intention is relevant to the terms implied as a matter of fact, where the question is what the parties would have stipulated had their attention been drawn at the time of contracting to the matter at issue. Intention is not, however, relevant to terms implied as a matter of law, 
As to the distinction between types of implied terms, see Tritel, The Law of Contract, 7th edition, 1987, dividing them into three groups, terms of implied fact, terms of implied law, and terms of implied as a matter of custom or usage, and Canadian Pacific Hotels Limited and Bank of Montreal. Requirements for reasonable notice in employment contracts fall into the category of terms implied by law, from Allison and Amoco Production Company. They do not depend upon custom or usage, although custom and usage can be an element in determining the nature and scope of the legal duty imposed. Nor do they fall into the category of terms implied as a matter of fact, where the law supplies a term which the parties overlooked but obviously assumed. Terms implied in contracts of employment imposing reasonable notice requirements depend rather on a number of factors, which must be decided with reference to each particular case, having regard to the character of the employment, the length of service of the servant, the age of the servant, and the availability of similar employment, having regard to the experience, training, and qualifications of the servant. These considerations determine the appropriate notice period on termination. They do not depend upon contractual intention. Indeed, some of them, such as the length of service and prospects of employment, are usually not known at the time the contract is made. Thus, the term of notice fixed by the court is, to borrow the language of Tritel at page 162, a legal incident of a particular kind of contractual relationship. In my opinion, this analysis is fully in accordance with the decision of this court in CP Hotels. In that case, Justice Ledin analyzed the basis upon which a term may be implied as a contract. The first category includes terms implied as a matter of custom or usage. In order for a term to be implied on this basis, there must be evidence to support an inference that the parties to the contract would have understood such a custom or usage to be applicable. Terms are implied in this manner on the basis of a presumed intention. The second category encompasses terms implied as necessary to give business efficacy to a contract. These are terms which the parties to a given contract would obviously have assumed. They are thus also implied on the basis of presumed intention and correspond to Tritel's category of terms implied in fact. The final category of implied terms considered in CP Hotels is the one applicable in the present case. These are terms not implied on the basis of presumed intention, but as legal incidents of a particular class or kind of contract, the nature and content of which have to be largely determined by implication. These correspond to Tritel's category of terms implied by law. Relying on the decision of the House of Lords in Liverpool City Council in Irwin, Justice Ledin suggested that the test for implication of a term as a matter of law is necessity. An examination of that case reveals what is meant by necessity in this context. In that case, the House of Lords was concerned to reject the test for implication of such terms proposed by Lord Denning, in dissent, in the Court of Appeal, under which a court could imply in law whatever term it thought reasonable, including anticipating the recommendations for statutory reform of law reform commissions. This, the House of Lords thought, seemed to extend a long and undesirable way beyond sound authority. In its place, Lord Wilberforce said that the applicable test was that such obligation should be read into the contract as the nature of the contract implicitly requires, no more, no less, a test, in other words, of necessity. The test for necessity adopted by the House of Lords in Liverpool City Council is not whether the term is necessary for the very existence of the contract. All members of the House approved the implication of a term that a landlord in a tenancy agreement had an obligation to keep common parts of the building in repair. While the tenancy agreement could have continued without this term, it was necessary in a practical sense to the fair functioning of the agreement, given the relationship between the parties. As Appeal Justice Cons described, in Tai Hing Cotton Mill Limited and Liu Chong Hing Bank Limited, the House of Lords took a practical view of necessity. I note that although the Privy Council reverses Appeal Justice Cons in the result, it specifically approved him as correct in the analytical approach adopted by him. Lord Wilberforce relied on the earlier decision of the House in Lister and Romford Ice and Cold Storage Company in stating that in determining what is necessary, regard must be had to both the inherent nature of a contract and of the relationship thereby established. 
As Viscount Simmons said in that case, the question is whether the term sought to be implied is a necessary condition of the contractual relationship. Thus, quote, the real question becomes not what terms can be implied in a contract between two individuals who are assumed to be making a bargain in regard to a particular transaction or course of business. We have to take a wider view, for we are concerned with a general question, which, if not correctly described as a question of status, can it only be answered by considering the relation in which the drivers of motor vehicles and their employers generally stand to each other? Just as the duty of care, rightly regarded as contractual obligation, is imposed on the servant, or the duty not to disclose confidential information, or the duty not to betray secret processes, just as the duty is imposed on the master not to require his servant to do any illegal act, just so the question must be asked and answered whether in the world in which we live today it is a necessary condition of the relation of master and man that the master should use a broad colloquialism, look after the whole matter of insurance. End quote. In the same way, the question which courts have been asking themselves is whether in the world in which we live today it is a necessary condition of the relation, to use more modern language, of employer and employee that there should be a contractual duty imposed on the employer to provide the employee with reasonable notice of termination? The answer provided has been a resounding yes. I agree with the following comment of Tritel on the Liverpool City Council necessity test. Quote, it is, with respect, hard to see any difference between attaching a legal incident to a contract on the ground of necessity and imposing a duty. End quote. To my mind, where the law has for many years imposed a legal duty on contracting parties, as it has in implying the term that employers must give employees reasonable notice of termination, that duty has clearly been found to be necessary, in the sense required by both the House of Lords in Liverpool City Council and this court in CP Hotels. Viewed thus, the error of the Court of Appeal was to characterize a term properly implied in law as a term to be implied in fact, this led the court to look to the intention of the parties as revealed in their course of dealing and the notice terms, now null and void, of their employment contracts in determining what notice period ought to be implied. As the parties had contracted for less than the reasonable notice of termination, the court held that it would be improper to imply a reasonable notice term into the contracts and held the plaintiffs to be entitled only to the minimum notice periods required by the Act. But what is at issue is not the intention of the parties, but the legal obligation of the employer, implied in law as a necessary incident of this class of conduct. The duty can be displaced only by an express contrary agreement. Since there is no contrary agreement here, the act having rendered what contrary agreement there was null and void, the reasonable term of notice implied by the law is not displaced and will be imposed by the court. I would dispose of the appeal as proposed by Justice Iacobucci. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at legallistening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.